welcome into God's house this morning. We ask the Lord to each blessing upon you as you worship with us today. Of course, today is Pentecost Day, and we do uh, thank God for all his blessings that accrue to us through the Lord Jesus Christ, especially, of course, the coming of the Holy Spirit upon God's people. Also, um, draw your attention to the bulletin in terms of the announcements. Uh, next Sunday is Fellowship Luncheon. So that's the first time we're having that for, for a while. Um, so most likely we will do it outside in the, in the courtyard, and, and tables are there already, but we'll put some more tables out um, and see how it goes. Uh, last week was a, a dress rehearsal. This week is actually real. Uh, Bob and Lois Martin will celebrate their wedding anniversary this week uh, on, on the 25th, their 58th wedding, uh, wedding anniversary. And we'll certainly uh, thank the Lord for them and their family and us. The Lord's richest blessings upon them. Well, let's stand and enter into God's presence with the singing of His praises as we sing from. The blue hymnal number 319. His righteousness he has revealed in the sight of the nations. He has remembered his mercy and his faithfulness to the house of Israel. 
All the ends of the earth have seen the salvation of our God. Shout joyfully to the Lord, all the earth. Break forth in song. Rejoice and sing praises. Sing to the Lord with the harp, with the harp and the sound of a song, with trumpets and the sound of a horn. Shout joyfully before the Lord, the King. People of God, let's worship the Lord with joyful hearts. Our strength and help is in the name of the Lord, and He is the one that has created the heavens and the earth. To those who are called, sanctified by God the Father, and preserved in Jesus Christ, mercy, peace, and love be multiplied to you. Amen. Let's worship God further in song. We sing from the Blue Hymnals number 393. chapter 2 verse 28 and it shall come to pass afterward that I will pour out my spirit on all flesh your sons and your daughters shall prophesy your old men shall dream dreams your young men shall see visions and also on my men servant and on my maid servants I will pour out my spirit in those days and I will show wonders in the heavens and in the earth, blood and fire and pillars of smoke. The sun shall be turned into darkness and the moon into blood before the coming of the great and awesome day of the Lord. And it shall come to pass that whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. For in Mount Zion and in Jerusalem, there shall be deliverance, as the Lord has said, among the remnant whom the Lord calls. And now let's come before God with our prayer of confession. Our Father in heaven, we're so thankful that from the beginning you have ordained good things for your people that you always intended to bring them into a most intimate relationship with yourself. Even in eternity past, when you set your love upon your people, you did so, so that they would be holy, so that we could see you, 
they'll get have fellowship with you. And our Father in heaven, we know that that accomplishment could never be put upon our shoulders. Because as it were, we failed from day one. But our Father in heaven, we're so thankful that you purposed through your Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. And we're so thankful that he has finished his work, that he has laid down his life, that he has removed our sins far from us. But also, our Father, that you have showered upon us not only your blessings, uh, but also your Holy Spirit, with whom we are sealed as adopted children, through whom we have full access to your mercies and to your grace and to your presence. And our Father in heaven, we pray that we may never be discouraged then in our pursuit of holiness. Because we know that he that is in us, your Holy Spirit, is greater than he that is in the world. And where sin abounds, grace will much more abound. And that he will indeed accomplish and complete that work which is begun in us to purify us, to sanctify us through your word. And our Father, then we pray then that we would go forth into this week seeking to make more progress on that journey of holiness. Our Father, then we pray that you would indeed forgive us for our sins, that you would cleanse us through the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ, that you would assure our hearts, and that you would fix our eyes on your word so that we might pursue it with all that we have, to put to death the deeds of the flesh, to put on the Lord Jesus Christ and his righteousness. Our Father in heaven, we pray that you would indeed lead us forward into holiness, so that we may be good witnesses of you, and we may see your work in us grow day by day from one glory to another. Our Father, hear our prayers, for we pray these things in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. As a response, as we sing from the Blue Hills once again, number 396. just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. That doesn't mean that God doesn't care about sin. Every week he forgives us, he forgives us. No, God cares about sin. 
and we see how much he cares over the pain and suffering of our Lord Jesus Christ on the cross. So it wasn't free. It came at a cost. And we thank him for the forgiveness of our sins and the encouragement to pursue holiness. You may be seated. The morning offering will now be received and it will be for the general. Father in heaven, we do come before you once again to adorn your throne with the praises of your people, to pour out from our hearts the gratitude that we have from all that you have provided for us so freely, how you have lavished your grace upon us, how you did not even spare your only begotten Son, but gave him up for us all. And our Father in heaven, we stand amazed at the benefits that are ours in the Lord Jesus Christ. And never in our wildest dreams would we ever have imagined that you would grant us such blessings, that they are far beyond anything that anyone would ever expect in a million years. Because not only have you given your son through the anguish and the agony that he experienced while living below, and also upon incurring your wrath and judgment for our sins. But our Father, that you have also granted us such a privileged position. You have reserved seats for us in heaven itself. You, are, you have prepared places for each and every one of your children in your glorious house. You have given us access to yourself, of which we have a foretaste now through your Holy Spirit, through the avenues of grace, through prayer, through your word. But our Father in heaven, these are only foretastes of what we will have in eternity when we will be with you, uninterrupted by sin, and our Father in heaven, what a privilege and a glory that is for us to look forward to. How it makes light the burdens and the struggles and the trials that we experience in this life. And our Father in heaven, we confess so often that we do get discouraged. We do other words that we should not utter. We say that things are not fair for us as we compare ourselves with others, even Christians. But our Father in heaven, we know that all such words and murmurings will vanish away for eternity in the light of the joys that will be ours 
in heaven. As our Father, we so thankful that you have blessed us so abundantly uh, that we can have peace and comfort and hope in our hearts, even at, in the midst of trials and difficulties that life brings. And our Father, all of that, uh, not because we deserved any of it, but because you set your love upon us and you accomplished all of these things uh, through your Son, our Lord Jesus Christ. And our Father in heaven, today we celebrate. We celebrate Pentecost. We celebrate the, the fullness of the harvest. Even as our Lord Jesus Christ said, a seed has to fall into the ground and die before it can bring forth fruit. And our Father in heaven, we know that wonderful uh, analogy from the Old Testament of the Feast of Harvest, Feast of Weeks. And our Father in heaven, what a fullness of harvest this is. As we look back over the years and the centuries of that gospel continuing to bring more and more sinners into your wonderful kingdom. And our Father in heaven, we pray that that would still continue. And our Father in heaven, we pray that you would indeed bless us and uh, our church, that we might uh, indeed be that fountain from which the river of life flows to others so that they might drink and live. Our Father in heaven, we pray that you would be with your people, especially those that are uh, facing struggles and trials in their life. And Lord, we do uh, pray for those that are facing health issues with cancer, and we continue to lift up Linda Dodd's brother and uh, Sharon Savage and Joan Smith. And our Father in heaven, we pray that you would uh, comfort and surround them with your mercy and grace. And Lord, that you would uh, uh, grant healing and remission, but more than that, comfort and hope uh, in their hearts. Our Father in heaven, we pray that you would also be with uh, our seniors. We continue to remember them, especially when they cannot attend church. And our Father in heaven, we pray that you would surround them with your comfort and Lord, that we might continue to take the opportunities that we have to visit with them, even though that is restricted many times due to shutdowns. But Lord, we pray that you would uh, lift up their spirits, even today, and uh, pour out a rich measure of your grace. And we pray also for Hemain in prison. And uh, our Father, we know what a, what a long journey that has been and continues to be. And uh, how devastating it is for her day by day. And we just pray that you would indeed uh, bless her physically as well as spiritually and to be with her family in uh, Colombia. Our Father in heaven, we pray that you would also be with our nation. We know the struggles uh, that are faced and the divisions that exist. And Lord, it is a bewilderment to us how uh, a nation such as ours can fall into such a terrible condition and uh, though we want to show love to uh, nations around the world yet that love seems to be missing when it comes to those in this country and our Father in heaven we pray for, for all levels uh, from uh, the president down it seems everyone is infected and the church is not immune and these divisions and arguments uh, persist in the church too and how, uh, what a lamentable thing that is for us. And our Father, then we pray that you would grant us wisdom, that as churches we may rise above all the uh, acrimony that exists, that we may be those that promote peace and uh, not those that insist on their own way. Our Father, then we pray that we might be a, a force for good in this nation, that we might lift up our voices to the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ that will change hearts and minds and bring about peace and love toward one another. Our Father in heaven, we pray that you would indeed bless our government, bless the president and all the cabinet as well as uh, the houses, uh, the senate and the congress. And Lord, we just pray that you would uh, bring upon them a real sense of responsibility 
to you uh, to be good leaders and to uh, care for the people and to honor you as the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. Our Father in heaven, we also thank you for blessings that you bestow upon us. And we do uh, thank you for Bob and Lois and their, uh, their 58th anniversary this, uh, this week on Tuesday. And we ask that you would continue to uh, richly bless them and their family. And Lord, that you would enrich their lives and that they may continue to walk with you. Our Father in heaven, we pray that you would bless us this morning also as we hear your word. We pray, Lord, that you would open our minds and hearts to receive it with reverence and awe and with a real desire to conform to every word uh, that, you, that the scriptures speak to us. Our Father in heaven, we pray that you would uh, hear our prayers that we bring personally to you. And not only those that are here, those that are joining us in, on live stream. And Lord, we pray that you would assure each and every one of your children that you care for each and every one. And though there are many problems in the world, uh, in, your, in your church, nevertheless, you never overlook uh, the least of your children. And so, Father, we pray that you would hear our prayers and that you would answer them according to your grace. Stand and praise God as we sing on Blue Hymn of number 395. 395.
Our scripture reading this morning is taken from uh, Acts chapter 2, verses 1 to 21. And since it was ascension uh, earlier in the week, uh, this evening's sermon will be looking at the ascension of our Lord Jesus Christ. First of all, Acts chapter 2, verses 1 to 21. When the day of Pentecost had fully come, they were all with one accord in one place. And suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind, and it filled the whole house where they were sitting. Then there appeared to them divided tongues as of fire, and one sat upon each of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit, and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. And there were dwelling in Jerusalem Jews, devout men, from every nation under heaven. And when this sound occurred, the multitude came together and were confused, because everyone heard them speak in his own language. Then they were all amazed and marveled, saying to one another, Look! Are not all these who speak Galileans? And how is it that we hear each in our own language in which we were born? Parthians and Medes, Elamites, those dwelling in Mesopotamia, Judea and Cappadocia, Pontus and Asia, and Pergia and Pamphylia, Egypt and the parts of Libya adjoining Cyrene, Vistus from Rome, both Jews and proselytes, Cretans and Arabs. We hear them speaking in our own tongues the wonderful works of God. So they were all amazed and perplexed, saying to one another, Whatever could this mean? Others, mocking, said, They are full of new wine. But Peter, standing up with the eleven, raised his voice and said to them, Men of Judea and all who dwell in Jerusalem, let this be known to you, and heed my words. For these are not drunk, as you suppose, since it is only the third hour of the day. But this is what was spoken by the prophet Joel. And it shall come to pass in the last days, says God, I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. Your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. Your young men shall see visions. Your old men shall dream dreams. And on my servants and on my maidservants, I will pour out my spirit in those days, and they shall prophesy. I will show wonders in the heavens above and signs in the earth beneath, blood and fire and vapor of smoke. The sun shall be turned into darkness and the moon into blood before the coming of the great and awesome day of the Lord. And it shall come to pass that whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. So far, the reading of God's word. Dear people of God, as I've said, today we celebrate Pentecost, the day uh, that the Lord poured upon the church a most precious gift. That is the Holy Spirit to dwell with each and every one of God's people. And it wasn't on account that the church had achieved some level of goodness or holiness. It wasn't that the church now came to a pinnacle of spiritual uh, success. It wasn't that at all. Because, of, in fact, they were very discouraged. They were very fearful. They thought the whole thing had come to an end. They couldn't even believe that the Lord Jesus Christ was resurrected, even when he was standing right before them. No, it wasn't the height of their spirituality that brought about this response from heaven. No, rather it was the completion of the work of redemption by our Lord Jesus Christ. It was a pain for our sins. It was having a resounding victory over the devil as he was humiliated and defeated and all of our sins were nailed to the cross. It was the devil being silenced. And 
God's justice being fully met that gave rise to this wonderful blessings that God poured out from heaven upon his people. And these were blessings that the Old Testament had pointed to as it does in very down-to-earth ways. So that we could understand a little by little and grow in our understanding of God's purposes. And so they had all, all kinds of um, festivals, the feast, the feast of harvest, the feast of weeks uh, that they would celebrate, which is at the beginning of harvest, they would wait 50 days, um, and then the fullness of the harvest would come. And they were to do that every, every year, looking forward to this wonderful full harvest of God's redemptive purposes coming upon God's people. In fact, Leviticus 25, 16 talks about 50 days, where we get the Pente, uh, Pentecost from, 50 days. From the beginning of the harvest to the fullness as it came on the day of Pentecost. And even the Lord Jesus Christ, has, uh, of course, spoke uh, in the, even in the New Testament about that, talking about a seed that has to fall into the ground and die before it brings forth a, a plentitude of harvest. And that's what the Lord Jesus Christ did. Even though they didn't want him to die, they didn't want him to go to Jerusalem, but the seed had to fall into the ground. The seed had to die. There was no other way. But once that seed fell into the ground, well then life sprung up and it did on this glorious day of Pentecost. And it is associated, of course, with the Holy Spirit because even in the Old Testament, as we know from Joel, this was the fullness, this was the peak of God's accomplishment in terms of redemption, in terms of the blessings that would come upon us. All the blessings that we have, nothing is so precious than this personal connection with God of having Him dwell with us, with each and every one of us. That blessing is the highest that there is. Not simply to enjoy God's creation, not only just to enjoy ourselves, but to enter into this most intimate relationship with God. And again, in the Old Testament, that is pointed out too. You remember Moses uh, and the 70 elders and, and the Spirit was given from Moses to them and they began to prophesy and then two of them weren't with them and they were in the camp and they started prophesying and uh, the others said, oh no, look, these two, should we stop them, Moses? And he said, why are you saying that? You're, doing, you're saying that to protect me? Are you concerned about me to have my name above everyone else that I would stand out? He said, I, his desire was that everyone would have that. Everyone would have this name. And on this day, that came true. And of course, Joel speaks about that as we've read a couple of times, one from Joel and then one repeated in Acts chapter 2. This was God's intentions all along. To bring us to himself. And we want to make sure that we don't get sidetracked by, I mean, everything good gets, gets abused in this world. And at times it's no different in the church. And so we have this glorious and wonderful blessing of God, of the Holy Spirit. And what do we do? We start movements. We begin with the charismatic movement. We begin with the vineyard movement. We begin with the Pentecostal way back. Everyone taking this wonderful gift of God, the Holy Spirit, and turning it into something that, that doesn't bring blessing. It doesn't build up the church. It divides the church. As they deny the Holy Spirit to all the people in the church. They cannot speak about Joel the way that he speaks about God's people. They can't speak that way. Oh no, it's almost like, as, as we say uh, in our society today, virtue signal. No, they're the ones that have the Holy Spirit because they are so much better than everyone else. And everyone else has to catch up. 
And I don't find that in Acts chapter 2, do you? Anywhere? I don't find it in Joel anywhere. I don't find it in Moses. Because it's never intended to be treated that way. And so on this day, we do celebrate with all God's people the blessings that we all share. That is fellowship with God. And as we read this passage, I want to focus upon three ways of looking at it. And so I want, I want to point out the ecclesiastical nature of this event, and then the evangelical nature of this event, and then the es eschatological nature of this event. So first of all, the ecclesiastical nature of this event, uh, in verses 1 to 4. It was for the church of the Lord Jesus Christ. We read that they were all gathered together on the day of Pentecost. And this is not simply a reference to the apostles. Lest we, as I say, go into the direction of there's only special people that get the Holy Spirit. Not at all. Moses would, would uh, soon bat that down. There weren't just the 12 apostles that there were many more with them in that upper room. In fact, the number is given. There was 120 in that room. And every single one of them. There wasn't a theological test, an evaluation of all those up there, and only the, the, the super Christians got it. No, everyone received the Holy Spirit. As Joel said, not only some but your sons and your daughters, your men servants, your uh, female servants, everyone. Everyone that believes in God, in the Lord Jesus Christ. And if we look back to the Old Testament types, they were all directed. God's people were directed to celebrate those feasts. It wasn't just for some. It was for the whole nation, all the people of God. This day was so chosen because God's people were gathered together, even those that were to be saved from many nations of the world. There were many that had gathered in Jerusalem. Not just Jews, by the way, but proselytes. Those that come to Jerusalem to celebrate this event. And they were privileged to hear the gospel. And on that day, they believed in the Lord Jesus Christ. 3,000 uh, believed and were baptized. And let me assure you, every single one of them also received the Holy Spirit. There wasn't a probation. They didn't have to be in the church six months, three months, however long. No, they received the Holy Spirit the moment they came to faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. And as that, the gospel extended, and they went to different parts, taking the gospel with them, those people also received the Holy Spirit. And to impress it on the minds of the Jewish apostles, since they were all uh, uh, Jews, and this conflict between Jews and, and the Gentiles, they received it in the same way they did at Jerusalem, so that there would be no argument whatsoever that this was not a lower blessing of God because it wasn't attended with the things that happened in Jerusalem. No, things happened exactly the same way because God wanted them to understand it wasn't just for them. It was for all God's people. And of course that doesn't continue. We might say, well, we should get it as well today. No, it doesn't have to continue. It was being established in the New Testament. Once that truth is established, then you don't need the signs that go along with it. But be assured of this. Every single one. It is for the church of the Lord Jesus Christ. And this is a day that all God's churches, all God's people are to celebrate. There ought to be no differences. There ought to be no discounting some and narrowing it in any way. No, the scriptures will not allow it to be narrowed in any way. For the, for the work of the Lord Jesus Christ flows to every believer. It is for all Christians. The Holy Spirit has beyond doubt 
the moment that you believe, the Holy Spirit indwells you. In fact, without the Holy Spirit, you can't come to faith. Without the Holy Spirit, you don't understand the gospel. Without the Holy Spirit, your heart is not inclined to believe in the Lord Jesus, Jesus Christ. It is the Holy Spirit that enlightens our hearts. It is the Holy Spirit that moves us. Rather than rejecting the Lord Jesus Christ and going our own way, to falling down before him and confessing, my Lord and my God. No, each and every one of us becomes the temple of the Spirit of God. Some Reformed also err in this regard as they try to argue for equality among believers on account of this blessing. Again, a foolish move. Their, their argument goes, well, since everyone has the Holy Spirit, then we're all equal. Then there is no such thing as ministers and elders and deacons and other kinds of things. No, 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 we're all equal. I mean, after all, that's what the Bible says. I guess once we become Christians, there's no fathers, there's no mothers either. We can all stand on our own two feet. There's no governments. We don't need any rulers over us. It's a foolish thing. Yes, we do have the Spirit of God, but it doesn't mean that there's no order in the church. I mean, Ephesians 4 speaks about gifts that the Holy Spirit himself gives. Not people take them to themselves, that the Holy Spirit is the one that gives gifts. And what gifts does he give? Well, it certainly includes all believers receiving gifts, but we don't all receive the same gift, do we? I mean, there are apostles, there are pastors, there are teachers, there are elders. It doesn't mean they are better than everyone else, no. But it does mean that there's order in the church of the Lord Jesus Christ. So though we are to rejoice at the fact that we all receive the Holy Spirit, we ought not to allow the devil to lead us to abusing that. No, we are to be submissive. We are to recognize order that God has placed in the church and in our world at large. And we need to respect those. Moses wasn't interested in power, was he? I mean, what a, what a, a servant of God. And yet he's described as the meekest man. The one that went up against Pharaoh. The one that led the people of God out of Egypt. The meekest man. No, the Spirit doesn't make us proud. The Spirit doesn't put us on a pedestal for everyone else to recognize us. No. The Spirit makes us servants of God. And it's a once and for all event. It's not repeated. I mean, I should take those words back. You might understand them in the wrong way. It is repeated in the sense that the Holy Spirit is given to believers over and over and over again as more and more people come to faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. No, that, that, that continues. Right? Every time a person comes to faith, the Holy Spirit is poured out upon that person. But the event of Pentecost as it took place in Acts chapter 2 doesn't happen over and over again. The Spirit of God has been given, poured out on the church, and it continues to, he continues to flow into the hearts of God's people. But it's not done in this way, the initial way. It was for a little while, but as I said, that was more in, in, intended for the, for the Gentile Christians not to be viewed as inferior. You didn't want the Jews saying, oh, yeah, well, when we had Pentecost, well, there were, you know, tongues of fire and they came upon us and we all spoke in different languages. But when the, when the a Gentile uh, got it, well, there was nothing attending to that. So they must be second class. No, no, there is no second class in God's kingdom. And so for a while, even the Gentiles, even Peter, when he goes, and, and preachers, that's what happened. The Holy Spirit came upon them and they uh, spoke in, in tongues as well. And, and that was Peter's response. What was I to do? I mean, in Jerusalem with the others, what was I to do? Well, why was he talking that way if there wasn't resistance to this idea 
the, the Gentile Christians were equal with Jewish Christians. No, there was that contention. But no, we don't experience Pentecost over and over again. In the same way that we don't experience the death of Christ on the cross over and over and over again. Which is why we get very irked when the Roman Catholics view the Mass as a continuation of the crucifixion of our Lord Jesus Christ. That rubs us up in the wrong way. Terribly wrong way. Because he said it was finished. So the pouring out, the act of God giving his Holy Spirit upon believers is a once and for all event. One that we do not try to repeat, as I said, as some do in various movements. But the question comes to make it more personal for each and every one of us. How do we know that we have the Spirit then? I mean, if we don't want to fall into the trap of charismatics and Pentecostals uh, denying that we have the Spirit because they associate all kinds of things with it, how do we know that we have the Spirit? Well, as we've been going through 1 John, there are various tests of that, isn't it? Nowhere in 1 John does he speak about having tongues of fire over you. Nowhere in 1 John does he refer to speaking in tongues, does he? So how do we know? We know that we have the Spirit of God when we believe that Christ is the Son of God. That he came down to this earth in human form. That his death on the cross was a sacrifice for our sins. That we love one another from the heart. That we seek to live a life of holiness. Not that we're perfect, but that we pursue holiness, even as we've spoken about that earlier in the service. That's how we know. How can anyone say that the Lord Jesus Christ has come in the flesh and is from heaven without the Spirit of God? They cannot. They may be able to utter the words, but if they do it in hypocritical ways, in other ways it's just words that they don't really believe it, then of course they don't, they don't have the Spirit of God. But when we believe it with all of our hearts, even though we do not speak in tongues, even though we don't see all kinds of signs and wonders, we do believe that we have the Spirit of God. In the same way that we believe that the gospel was from God, that the Lord Jesus Christ was from God. Well, what are the evidences that the Scriptures give? Well, all the signs and wonders, all the miracles that He did. But we don't expect those miracles to be done now, do we? I mean, some people do, by the way, in the churches. That we need to do signs, and in fact the movement is called Signs and Wonders. Because they say the only way you're going to preach a gospel is it has to be with signs and wonders. That's the evidence. Well, how many years are you going to keep providing evidence? I mean, does it never get settled? I mean, that's like going to court and winning, winning uh, the case, and then every day, every week after that, you have to keep providing more evidence, more evidence, more evidence. No, God already confirmed his son. He already confirmed the gospel through signs and wonders that nobody could deny. But once that was established, there was no reason to continue. No, there's no reason for these churches to fake miracles for the sake of the gospel. The gospel doesn't need miracles. It has enough. Thank you very much. And they're written at large in the scriptures for people to read. If they don't believe them, they're not going to believe the ones that they try to imitate. No, people of God, personally, you have the Spirit. If you believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. If you honestly, with all your heart, believe that he died on the cross as God's lamb that taketh away the world, then you do believe. 
If you believe he is a Christ, the son of the living God, then you have the spirit because that's the only way you're going to make that statement. So let no one intimidate us. Let no one cast doubt on the fact that we have received the spirit of God. No, let our hearts rejoice. And let us thank God that he has granted us this wonderful fellowship with him and that he is working in us. That's his task. To begin and complete that work of holiness in our hearts, to purge every sin, to make us righteous in the, in the sight of God. Not that we're going to be saved because of that righteousness that has been achieved. No. I mean, that is already done by the Lord Jesus Christ. So why this work of holiness? Because how in the world are we going to dwell with God for eternity if we don't purge every sin? He's equipping us. Yes, in the sight of God, in a, in a legal, legal sense, we are righteous before God. But we want to be inside what God has granted to us through the Lord Jesus Christ. We don't want to be sinners dressed in garbs of holiness. We want to be dressed in the righteous robes of the Lord Jesus Christ and be righteous inside. And that's what the Holy Spirit is working in us to do. But also there's an evangelical aspect to this wonderful event. And that kind of ties in with the way that the Holy Spirit was manifested in terms of coming upon uh, the, the church of the Lord Jesus Christ. They, start, they started speaking in tongues. Well, why could it not be some other sign? Why couldn't it be a sign that we could jump out of the building and not get hurt? Why couldn't it be some other dramatic sign? I mean, after all, that's what the, the devil said to Jesus. Why don't you jump from the pinnacle of the temple? Why this sign? Because it had to do with the purpose that God had for the church of the Lord Jesus Christ, that the Lord Jesus Christ himself already told them earlier. But you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you shall be witnesses to me in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. The church was commissioned. And that commission is reflected in the way that God manifests the Holy Spirit coming. So when the Holy Spirit came, they all began to speak without knowing the languages. All these languages that are mentioned in Acts chapter 2 as a way of enforcing upon the minds of the church what their task was, even as the Lord Jesus Christ said. All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Therefore, go into all the world and preach the gospel, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. They weren't to remain in Jerusalem. They would go to the ends of the earth. And they needed this power. And that power is, is shown by the fact that they are able to speak in other languages. And all of these people are shocked. I mean, it's not them. I mean, so often with all of these things going on, people claim certain things, and it's, it's kind of very dubious. Because, because, again, not to really trash certain movements, but they, but they claim to speak in tongues, and it's just gibberish. With all due reverence, it's just gibberish. There's no doubt in terms of Pentecost, that what they spoke wasn't gibberish because the people that did know those languages were so surprised. And they said, how is it that these Galileans that don't know our language and they're speaking these languages? And they, and they told them what they were speaking about. They were speaking about the wonderful works of God. In, in other words, the gospel. It wasn't fake. It wasn't a show. To tell people how holy we are and look we can speak in this heavenly language. No one was saved by hearing heavenly language. 
They're saved by hearing the gospel. And so all of these people heard the gospel and they were given the power to go outside, even though they were mocked by some as being drunk. I've never heard a drunk person. I mean, they can't even speak English, never mind another language. It is gibberish when they talk. But they could hear the gospel. And they were all surrounding them, hearing these, and they were cut to the heart. Oh no, they had the power. The Jewish leaders were against the Lord Jesus Christ. They had crucified him. They had threatened the apostles. And yet here, every one of them, not only the apostles, but also the believers were standing outside in public, declaring the mighty works of God, preaching the Lord Jesus Christ. No fear. And the message that they brought, as I said, were the wonderful works of God. And Peter's sermon is an example of that. Calling men, women, and children to repentance and faith. In fact, as we've, uh, as we've heard, 3,000 came to faith on that day. The gospel was preached. And people heard it. And the mission field is global. There were Jews from every nation under heaven, we're told, in chapter 2, verse 5. The Spirit gave the disciples utterance so that they could carry out their main goal, preaching. They understood Hebrew, but God emphatically showed that they, that they are to go out to all, to all the nations, every tribe, every nation. There has to be no barrier, and God overcame those barriers as he granted to them the ability to speak in those languages. It doesn't mean that missionaries that go out have to receive that knowledge of the language in a miraculous way like they had in the, in the uh, Acts chapter 2. No, yes, they do have to go to language school. They do have gifts to them, equipping them with all that they need. To bring the gospel to the world that they might believe and be saved. And finally there was an eschatological nature to this event. These were the last days. The disciples asked the Lord about the kingdom in Acts chapter 1 before he ascended into heaven. Therefore when they came together they asked him saying, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? And he said to them, It is not for you to know times or seasons which the Father has put in his own authority, but you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you shall be witnesses to me in Jerusalem, in all Judea, Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. You see, the Lord turned their hearts to the work at hand. They were all about, oh, the kingdom is coming, and now, you know, we're going to rule, and their thoughts before, who was going to sit where, what cabinet positions they were going to get, and when it was going to be established. And the Lord Jesus Christ took their minds right off that. What are you, what are you, what are you thinking? There's a whole era of work to do and you're thinking right towards the end so he says it's not for you to know these times it's not for you to fill your heads with these thoughts and try and work these things out not that that stopped the church from doing it and continues to do it no we're to be about the task that God has given to us to preach the gospel. To have the church built up as God wants it to be built up. For this harvest. Even as the Lord Jesus Christ said. Pray for laborers. Because the field is white with harvest. There's a whole lot of work to do. To preach the gospel. Rather than to fight amongst each other. About when that day is. And how it's going to come. As we, as people do. Now the gospel is our aim. 
the Old Testament, the last days of Joel's prophecy were starting at Pentecost. These are the last days. After all, this is the age of the Spirit. This is the age of the Spirit working amongst churches and strengthening God's people to preach the gospel and to, and to gather together God's church, to build God's church, to work in every believer that work that the Holy Spirit has begun. And when does it end? In the day of Christ. That's when it will be accomplished. Not in each and every one of us, but in all of us it will be accomplished when the Lord Jesus Christ comes. Of course, when we die, that is the end of that work. But the end of the work in all of God's people as a whole will only be when the Lord Jesus Christ returns. So this is what we have then in Pentecost. It's the beginning of the end. It's the last part of God's redemptive purposes. It's a glorious part because in a sense of victory has already been won by the Lord Jesus Christ. And now God takes and builds his church. Now he applies the power of that work. And we see that. We see that in our own day. And we hear about the church in all countries of the world. We, see, we hear about the church growing in various countries where there's so much opposition to the gospel and intimidation of the churches. And yet the church grows. It doesn't matter whether it's communist countries, it doesn't matter whether it's Islamic country, whatever country it is, the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ has penetrated. And believers continue to stand and believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. Now Pentecost, this is the last stage of history. We ought not to be worrying and scratching our heads. Oh, it's never going to happen. Is this going to continue? No, it is going to happen when God completes His work. Lest we think that this stage will give way to another, let us note that this period will end with the day of the Lord. That's the way Joel speaks about it. And that's the way he is quoted in Acts chapter 2. The sun shall be turned into darkness and the moon into blood before the coming of the great and awesome day of the Lord. Now it's going to end then. And so we're to be busy about that work. We're not to get so sidetracked because there's so many ways of getting sidetracked. We need to keep our focus upon God's redemptive plan. And the last orders we got from the Lord Jesus Christ was that they would await in Jerusalem, the Holy Spirit would come upon them, He would give them power for one task and one task alone, to be witnesses, to preach the gospel, so that He may build His church and no one will stand against it. We don't have to worry. The devil cannot stop us. Never mind the world. And so we're to rejoice. And every single one of us has a part to play. We have the Holy Spirit. We've been equipped for it. We have a part to play. Let us do that. And let us keep our eyes and hearts focused on that day of the Lord, even as Peter says, we should pray earnestly so that we might hasten that day when the Lord Jesus Christ returns and all God's people are brought safely into their eternal home. Amen. Let us pray. Our Father in heaven, we're so thankful and we're so excited to realize what you have done in each and every one of us. And our Father in heaven, we pray that we would never forget that. We would never let anyone pour cold water on these glorious truths. That we may never feel weak, but rather, our Father, that we might understand that we have the most wonderful knowledge of your mystery 
the mystery of the gospel. And then, our Father, you've opened our eyes, not to understand it, but to experience it too. And our Father, then we pray that we might be faithful witnesses of the Lord Jesus Christ. And that we might continue to experience that wonderful event as the gospel went out and many from all nations came to faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. And that that work has been continuing ever since. And our Father in we pray that you would continue that work through this generation of your people and for generations to come until all are safely brought in. Our Father, hear our prayers, bless and strengthen your church, for we pray these things in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Let us stand and respond as we sing from the Blue Hymnals, number 391. May the God of peace who brought up our Lord Jesus Christ from the dead, that great shepherd of the sheep, through the blood of the everlasting covenant, make you complete in every good work to do his will, working in you what is pleasing in his sight through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen.